three different passages to do with the birth of Christ with one point, one key from each passage. Okay, uh, the first two are from Luke and the third one is from Matthew. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. We can meet here together, Lord. We thank you for the beautiful weather. We thank you for protecting Penang and, and many states, Lord, from, from heavy from rains, heavy rains, Lord. We thank you for drying up the waters of places that have been flooded. We thank you, Lord, for your grace upon all those uh, individuals and families affected by the downpour and, and by blackouts in, in KL and Paham and other places. We ask you, Father, to comfort the grieving families who have lost loved ones in the floods, Lord, and through COVID and any other circumstances. We ask for your peace, even as your angels declare peace and goodwill to all men, Lord. So we thank you, Father, for releasing your shalom over this land, over each one of our lives. We thank you for speaking to us this morning giving us yes to hear your voice in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the first passage of the Christmas story is the foretelling of the birth of Christ from Luke chapter 1, verse 26, where we read about the angel Gabriel visiting Mary. It says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And we all know that Mary is, is, is favored, but you know, I want us to remember that um, there are many levels of favor in her life. She was favored obviously because she was chosen to, to bear uh, Christ, but why was she chosen also, not just for who she was, but because of her association and connection with Joseph. Because Jesus had to come to the line of David, of which was Joseph. So whoever Joseph was connected to, in fact, any one of his siblings, um, it would be someone connected to them for Christ to be born. So obviously, Joseph was perfect because he had not married Mary yet, and, um, and the timing was just right. In fact, we read that in the fullness of time, Christ came. You know, and, and sometimes you wonder why God are you so late so long, you know, to answer our prayers. But you know what? Many have heard the phrase, He's never late or never early. God is usually perfectly on time. But sometimes His timing is not our timing. And so Jesus came at the perfect time of human history. Some may say it was the wrong time, it was a bad time, but really it was the best time in His plan of events. So we have to trust His timing. And remember when, when um, the disciples and Mary came looking for Jesus while he was preaching and they said, Jesus, your, your mother, your brothers are here. Remember what Jesus said? Who are my mother and who are my brothers? Those who do the will of my Father. So if your heart this morning is to do the will of the Father, you are just as favored as Mary was. You're just as favored as Mary was. You know, so I want to encourage you. It, it's, uh, it's, it's possible 
uh, to be favored through faith. Amen. So, can you imagine if an angel suddenly appeared to, to, to one of you ladies who was engaged before you were married and told you this message? How would you feel? And somebody, she was a teenager, she was maybe 14 or 15 years old. And obviously, it says, but she was greatly troubled. I think that was the other statement. <laughs> you know, can you imagine? A teenage girl suddenly seeing a big angel, right, giving you the message. I say, I, I'm, I'm surprised she didn't faint. Could have said, but she suddenly fainted. <laughs> and the teenage girl would have fainted. But she was greatly troubled at the same and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, but you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. When Paul said, it says, the angel is replying to the question, how can I conceive if I'm a virgin? And the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. You know, when I read the word overshadow, I'm, I'm, I, I think of creation in Genesis 1. How the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And nothing happened until God said, let that be. So the spoken word became manifest, let that be light. But before God spoke, the Holy Spirit was already there, over the waters. So it's like the Holy Spirit had already been, was, was over Mary. And now the word was released. Now so important was her response to the word from the angel. And so the angel said, um, the Most High will overshadow you, the child will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. But nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, thank God she said this, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now isn't it amazing? The angel is replying Mary's question. She's a young girl, a teenager, probably terrified. Suddenly she's told you can conceive a child without any human intervention, supernaturally. And, uh, and, and it's actually going to be the Son of God, the Son of Man. And so obviously she's full of doubt and fear and unbelief. And so what did the angel do? Give her a testimony. What was the testimony? Yes, Mary, you know your, your relative, Elizabeth? You know how she was barren? She's tried to have a child for so many years that she couldn't. But guess what, Mary? She has also conceived as in a six month. See, isn't it amazing that the angel testified to Mary because of the doubt? So in other words, the angel was saying, Look, Mary, if your, if your cousin, your relative could conceive if her womb was dead, if her womb was barren, that she was old, and now she can conceive, is anything too hard for God? Is anything impossible for God? So what do you think is harder? I mean, he, the angel didn't ask, but I'm asking. The angel could have asked this. Mary, is it harder for the Lord to revive a dead womb in an old woman or to conceive in you supernaturally? Is either harder than the other? No. So Elizabeth can conceive in an old age with a dead womb. Why can't we conceive supernaturally? Is one harder than the other? You know, the amazing thing is that the, the, the wives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know what God's call for Abraham was, right? To be fruitful, to multiply, to fill. It says the nations will be filled with, with, you know, your seed shall be like the stars of heaven. And guess what? All the wives he gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all started with barren wombs. Think about that. The one whose promise was to, to, to multiply and have, you know, the, the 12 tribes and all that, didn't start in a situation that was possible by men. It started with a situation impossible with men. And not for the hand of God, Abraham said, But God, if this is true, why do you give me a barren wife? And Jacob could have said the same thing. And, and Isaac could have said the same thing. And you see, without faith, we cannot please God. And God will never expect us to do anything that doesn't require faith. Who will never give us an assignment that we can fulfill without his intervention. If you don't need him, you may take the glory. 
But when he tells him to do something and gives you a job, it's usually impossible without him. So that when it gets done, he gets all the glory. And so the angel says, nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. I'm glad Mary didn't say, How can it be? But let it be. Let it be to me according to what? Your word. Not let it be to me according to my understanding. Not let it be to me according to my experience. Not let it be to me according to my knowledge. But according to your word. Because many times, when you have to stand in the word of God, it will not make sense to your understanding. It will not, there's nothing in your experience to, to support the understanding of what God wants to do. So you have to totally and only trust in His word. God said it, we believe it, and that settles it. And that's what Mary had to do. Isn't that amazing, being so young, a teenager, I don't know how many teenage girls would have responded like that. So this is the first point, the foretelling of Jesus' birth. Let it be to me. So what has God told you to do? Have you struggled to believe God's word because you've been looking at yourself, at your experience, at your ability, at your understanding? And you say, God, I, I know you want me to do all these things. I got wonderful promises from you. Many men and women of God have prayed for me and prophesied over me. How can it be? No, don't say, how can it be? Say, God, let it be to me. Let it be to me. Not according to my understanding, but let it be to me according to your word. Because the Holy Spirit is looking for agreement. Agreement. All we have to do is surrender to the will of God. Don't worry about it, whether you like it or not, you know, it's like the enemy is lied to so many people that God's will is terrible. God's perfect husband or wife for you is the ugliest person. You know, God's call for you is to go to the hardest place in Africa or India. You know, and the enemy is lied that doing God's will is very hard, very difficult and not easy. But maybe not. You know, how much more, if every father and mother wants the best of their children, how much more God our Father? Right? So that's why we need to see God as a Father, that He will give you His desires. He will put His desires in you, so we can trust Him with the things. So what does this word speak of? Just as Jesus was conceived in her, in the womb of Mary, so too, and today we know it's not the actual day Jesus was born. It's just a day that, that the world kind of marks out as, chooses to remember the birth of Christ. We don't know exactly when He was born, most believe around September or October. But the important thing is not when he was born, but that he was born and died and rose again. So the date does not really matter, but it's a wonderful opportunity to evangelize. So it's good to, to, be, to be one in, in remembering the birth so that you can share with others. So that's why we choose this day, not because we believe that this is the day he was born, but we choose this day to remember his birth. And, uh, and just as Mary had to agree with the angel, we have to agree with what God has said to us. Why God has spoken to you through his prophets, through his ministers. Can you remember what the Lord has spoken to each one of you? Um, the promises has given you, and you wonder, how can it be? It's been so long, it's been so many years. Maybe you feel like Elizabeth, you're barren, the time is over, you're too old. But you know what, in Christ, there's no age. As you know, age is a matter of the mind. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, it's in the heart. Better to be an older person with young at heart than a young person with old at heart. Okay, there are lots of young senior citizens and very old young people. Okay, you want to be useful in our spirit. Like Caleb, remember how old Caleb was? And he said, give me my mountain. He was not 40 but 80. You know, so do not limit yourself. According to your word, Lord, not according to my age, not according to what I think I can or cannot do. It's according to how you will equip me and empower me. So when God speaks, and this is, you know, the angel didn't say Mary. Open the open the Holy Scriptures and go to one of the prophecies uh, where where it prophesies that Jesus will come. The angel could have done that because the birth of Christ was foretold, so he could have directed Mary to the Scriptures, but instead he just spoke the word because faith comes by hearing, not by reading. That does not mean that we don't read, but the purpose of reading the word is to hear the spoken word. See, the purpose of reading anything that is written is to get to know the author, to hear the voice of the author. So the angel spoke the word of God to Mary, and when she heard, she believed. So when we, every time we hear, we read the Bible, we hear a message, we're hearing this message, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. 
I mean, you, when you, and you know you have heard. You know how you know you have heard? The same way women know when they found the right dress. Right? Have you seen you go to the shop looking for dress and the salesperson says, oh, Can I help you? No, you know what you want? I don't know what I want, but when I see it, I know it. <laughs> so just as a woman knows the right dress when they see it, you will know the voice of God when you hear it. You don't have to worry. The big peace release faith. You know I have heard. So when you hear, faith arises. And, and you are your sheep, so you know his voice. So you don't have to worry and complicate matters. It's easy, you just know in your heart, I know I've heard this God speaking. Usually, if it's you speaking, you don't need faith. If the devil speaking, it causes fear. But when God speaks, it releases faith and peace. Amen. So respond like maybe. Let it be to me. Let it be to me. Not how can it be. Not, you know, let it be according to my experience, my understanding, my age. No, according to your word. And now we come to the second passage. Um, the birth of Christ in chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, the first seven verses. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were still there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. I think when, when people discovered who Jesus was, that was the worst day in the, in the, main, in the innkeeper's life, his biggest regret. What an opportunity he missed out. Can you imagine being the innkeeper telling Joseph, Mary, sorry, I'm too full. I don't know why. Why didn't he have room? You know what? I believe if he knew who it was, he would have made room. But he didn't make room because he had no revelation of who was standing before him. And because of a lack of revelation, he did not make room and they had to go to a manger. So even in his birth, his own did not receive him. Instead of being born with humans, he had to be born with animals. Isn't that amazing? And, you, and I begin to wonder how many times do we reject something that God wants to give us because we cannot receive it. And that's why Jesus was rejected by his own because his own people did not perceive who he was. They thought, you know, the Messiah who came would come riding in a white horse, you know, in splendor and gold and in a mighty army. They did not expect Jesus to come in the way he came, to be born in a major. They thought he'd probably be born in a palace. And so sometimes we can miss God's answers because we presume how he's going to answer us. Sometimes we say, God, give me an apple and we're waiting for fruit to drop and God wants to give me apple seeds. You know, sometimes we want the full, complete result when God wants you to plant and water, what will lead to the answer to your prayer. See, Jesus didn't come like the first Adam. You know how the first Adam came? The first Adam, God did not breathe, make from the dust, baby Adam. You know, breathe and then he's crawling and forming. No, no. He was a grown adult. You know, if the first Adam came as a grown adult, he could have sent Jesus as a grown adult too. Why not? But Jesus had to come in the form of a baby. And sometimes, God hears and answers us in seed form. You want to say, can you be, can you faithful to water that seed? with your prayers, with your confession, with your faith. Be faithful and see the seed grow to the answer to your desire. Sometimes I wonder, I mean, can you imagine how many times it says that the Jesus appeared and his disciples didn't know who he was? They thought he was a ghost. They thought he was somebody else. They didn't even recognize who he was. And you wonder how many of us don't believe or, or, or we say, sorry, I've got no room. But today the question is not whether we have room. It's, you know what our, our excuse is? No time. Right? We have plenty of room, but no time. So just as if the innkeeper knew, if Joseph said, Hey, innkeeper, before you chase us out, let me tell you who this baby is. Let me tell you who's in Mary's room. You know what happened? Joseph probably knew he wouldn't believe them anyways. Okay, but when we don't recognize and we don't recognize value, we will not make time. When we don't make time, what's the common excuse of many Christians? Sorry, La Pastor, too busy. And so we have reduced our walk with God to our convenience. And that is the biggest burden of the developed nation is a land of convenience. 
We have everything instant. Microwave, instant, this, instant, that, everything in the flick of a button, the switch. Once upon a time, you had to walk to the TV and push a button and turn it on. <laughs> then the first remote control was the broomstick on the TV. <laughs> okay. Now we have a gadget in our hand. Okay? You had to be able to turn and dial. It was so complex, so hard, so much of work to dial a number. You know, every number turn, one dial, now one button, off the dial. You know, life has become so convenient. And sometimes we expect God to answer us at our convenience. And we made him our emergency and rescue doctor when we are sick. Drive through, I got the problem, bye bye. And then we see God again when we have the next problem. But God doesn't want to see us when we have a problem, but He wants to walk with us every day, even when we are healthy. He wants to have a relationship with us. And so the innkeeper did not recognize who Jesus was. And so we need to pray every day, Lord, like the song we sing, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, that I will dis discern and perceive you. And you know what this is called? It's called the knowledge of His glory. And the Bible says in Habakkuk 2, the, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of His glory. Notice it could have said the earth will be filled with His glory. But the problem is not that there is no glory in earth, but no knowledge of His glory. Here was the glory of God in the womb of Mary, and the innkeeper had no knowledge of it. Jesus was born, prophecy fulfilled, and his own people, the Jews, had no knowledge of the glory of God before him. So God's goodness is present. It's just like, as I often talk about, gold in the earth. You know where gold is? It's not on the surface, it's in the rocks. It's hidden beneath the surface. And so we can be walking over a gold mine, but if you're not trained to discern and know where to find gold, you will have no knowledge of the glory under your feet. So sometimes, because we have no knowledge, we think we have no glory. God, you're not so good. Now, why did this happen? Why did that happen? And sometimes a lack of perception, we assume that God is not with us. We say, God, we have it. So I want to encourage you. Not, faith is not based on your natural perception. You say, Lord, I believe you're with me. Even in my challenging times, in my trying times, I don't want to be like the innkeeper. I recognize your presence. You said, Lord, that you are with me. Emmanuel, God with us. You never leave us nor forsake us. So we walk through the valleys, your, your, your presence will comfort us, your rod and your star, He is with you. Don't doubt it. Don't doubt based on your human mind. But by faith, know that God is with you. And that, and make room for Him. You will never find time for the Lord. You will never find time to pray. You will never find time to read the Word. You have to make time. We don't make time, there will be no time. It's just like in those days, you don't make room, there'll be no room, and you miss out. And then you look back and say, I say, why didn't I? What is I say? I don't know. I say, I say, it's the biggest regret because of lack of revelation. So don't be like the innkeeper. God is looking for a place of rest. Isn't that amazing? What the animals do in the manger, I think they mostly sleep in there. Right? The manger is not a place where you run around, it's not big, it's not a running around place. Animals go back to the manger to rest. And you know, this is the house that the Lord was looking for. In Isaiah, it says, He's looking for a house where He can lay His head, where He can rest. What does that speak of? A house of peace. He wants us to be a house of peace. That's why He told His disciples, when you enter home, say shalom, peace to this house. Because that describes Jehovah Shalom. Because in the place of peace and rest, can we, can we be led by where can we have ears to hear his voice? In the place of peace is there, um, wholeness and healing. Right? Shalom means everything is healthy, whole, complete, nothing missing, nothing broken. So to, to receive the power of his shalom, we have to be in the place of rest. How do we enter his rest? Through faith. How do we believe? Have ears to hear. Well, give me ears to hear your voice, like Mary, and to say, Let it be. Let it be to me according to your word. So what was the first point? The first point was, let it be, second point, open the eyes of my understanding that I will make time, I will make room. So make room for Him. Make room every day. You know the verse, seek first my kingdom, it begins each day. What do you seek first in the morning? It's not seek first chapitya. <laughs> seek first Shodhi Chanai. The seek first is, how am I going to eat today? Seek first Lord, I need your presence with me today. I need you to go before me. I need your peace. I need your joy to be my strength. I need your leading. Because if we don't have this peace, if we don't have the joy, nothing else to experience, 
is going to be fulfilling. We're going to end up the day stressed out, burnt out. So the key to having a good day, no matter what happens is, you're having it in His presence. Because you're seeking first His kingdom. You're seeking first His righteousness, His peace, His joy. Make room by making time for Him. Last passage in Matthew 1. Uh, the purpose revealed in His name. Matthew 1, 18-25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When His mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So his name reveals his purpose. Why is he called Jesus? Because Jesus means Savior. Save us from our sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So he came to save us from our sins. He came to dwell in us and with us, as we heard Pastor Anthony share last week. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So why did Jesus come? Jesus came to save us from our sins. He came to be with us. I love the I love the little children. What they do in school is they have something called show and tell. You know that? All the teachers know that. You bring something from your house, you show your friends, your classmates, and you talk about it. But if Jesus didn't come, they'll be tell and don't show. Again, the old covenant, old testament, was all telling. But the father said, hey, I need to show what I'm telling about. I need to send my son so you can see, you can touch him. You can sense my presence. And that's why Jesus was born. So that was the first show and tell. We got a question. Hey, you know where was the first show and tell? Jesus, Christmas Day, celebrates mankind's first show and tell. God told in the, in the prophets and he showed us to the birth of Christ. Why? To save us from our sins. Oh. And guess, guess what is so important to know? What's the root of all sin? Sometimes we, we reduce sin to the bad things we do or say or the, the things we don't do that we should have done. And you know what? The root of all sin is unbelief. In fact, there's a scripture that says anything not of faith is sin. Because anything not of faith leads to sin. Okay, and, and the price of sin is, you all know, all the sin. Or the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So Adam and Eve, why did they sin? Because they did not believe God's word. So the root behind the sin of disobeying God, of eating the fruit, forbidden fruit, was rooted in their unbelief of what God said, don't touch it. See, their job was not to understand God's instruction. Their job was to believe and obey. You know why they disobeyed God? Why did Adam and Eve not believe Him? Because it didn't make sense to their understanding. You know why they didn't, it didn't make sense to their understanding? Because the fruit was so beautiful like a durian. Right? The fruit was not, sorry, the fruit was so beautiful like a, I don't know, what's the most beautiful fruit? What's your favorite fruit? I don't know. Like a lovely mango. <laughs> okay? Or, or whatever. If God had made the forbidden fruit to be so ugly and smelly and, and foul looking, obedience would be so much easier, right? Yes, God, I obey you. Are you sure you obey me? No, you just don't like how it looks. Right? Their obedience would not have been tested if the fruit looked awful and smell awful. So God had to test their obedience by giving something that looked as good as all the other fruit that He made for them. I believe that the forbidden fruit was as good, if not better looking and smelling than all the other fruit that they could eat. The only difference was it was forbidden. Why? To test the motive for their obedience. Because if their obedience was based on understanding, they would have used all the other fruit to justify disobedience. But God, you gave us all this other fruit, and this looks just like that. So what's wrong with eating this? Right? I mean, it's not going to hurt anybody. What's wrong with it? You heard that, right? We justify our disobedience based on understanding. And anything that is not of faith, which means anything based on your understanding, that is not of faith, is sin. And so because they did not believe the word of God, and don't touch this fruit, 
they use their minds to reason why it's okay to disobey him and the presence of God left remember Jesus came to save us from our sins and to be with us and he was with them in the garden he would walk with them he would fellowship with them his glory was over them but the minute they sinned through unbelief they lost the glory of God the presence of God lost them uh, uh, they, they fell short of his glory so the challenge for us is to believe believe what? what he's telling you what the Holy Spirit is telling you when you believe you will do and the faith without action makes you just like the, the demons you know, James he says the demons believe and they tremble the demons are also believers which tells us that they have more faith than atheists even the demons believe in God but the atheists think they are they know better than demons <laughs> demons believe in God but they're still demons why? they don't obey because remember what the devil is called today is called the father of lies or once upon a time he was created in truth he was he was raised in a perfect environment of truth but all that knowledge didn't save him he ended up being the father of lies so we need to guard our faith like Mary let it be to me not according to your understanding not according to your age to your experience to what makes sense Lord you said it I believe it and out of the with our heart Romans 10 says we believe the righteousness with our mouth we confess unto salvation so I believe the minute Mary said let it be something happened her confession became salvation the, the, the child was conceived because she agreed with the word so we need this day more than ever before to live by faith the just shall live by faith how do you know you're living by faith you're filled with joy and peace in believing Romans 15 13 how to stay full of joy and peace you're living in response to God's goodness to the knowledge of his glory not God I don't see what you're doing I don't see anything like the innkeeper I don't know who you are you look like any other pregnant mother oh I don't have room but when you have the knowledge of his glory hey you are the fulfillment of all the promises I remember the prophets writing about you please come in I will make room can you recognize the goodness of God the innkeeper failed to recognize the presence of God in Mary can you recognize the goodness of God in your life and say yes Lord I believe let it be to me according to your word I will make room for you give me ears to hear your voice that I may believe and stay in your joy and your peace in your presence because your joy Lord is my strength how many know we need his strength to do what needs to be done we need his peace forgive us and protect us from doubting God's word based on we don't think he's such a good God because of the bad things we think he allows and does that God says look I'm going to close with this the foundation of our faith in, in the goodness of God Jeremiah 23 oh sorry Jeremiah 9 23 and 24 and Jeremiah 11 9 23 24 says let not the wise man glory in his wisdom let not the mighty man glory in his might nor let the rich man glory in his riches but let him who glories glory in this that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness justice and righteousness for in these I delight he is the Lord exercising loving kindness justice and righteousness and the Lord will say I know the thoughts I have for you are good not of evil to give you a future and a hope so believe in his goodness and say Lord let it be to me according to your word give me eyes to see to recognize your glory that I may make room for you let's pray